Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I have the chance to take a look at a really cool piece of World War II history. This is an American M3 submachine gun with an OSS manufactured silencer on it, or suppressor. These were, it was actually originally the Maxim uh, silencer company that suggested to the US government that perhaps they'd like to suppress the M3 submachine gun um, as it came into production, although Maxim didn't end up making these suppressors. The manufacturing was done by High Standard, and they were prototyped uh, in the fall of 1943, uh, put some development into it. These, these are the suppressors were basically the exact same way as High Standard's pistol suppressors from the same era. They don't use baffles, they actually use wire mesh. So we'll pull this apart in just a moment. Uh, however, um, so prototyping was done by the fall of 1943. Production started early in 44. The first units were actually being shipped in August of 1944. And it's a bit unclear exactly how often or how many of these were used in the field, but apparently they were really quite popular. And being a, a product for the OSS, they were often used for clandestine operations. In fact, there's a really cool story about this specific one, um, which is why it is still here. It was actually dropped to a European resistance fighter. He got this, and he got a well rod, and he got orders, and this was right at the end of World War II. He got orders to cross the border into Germany and assassinate a particular German politician and was all set to do this, got his guns, and uh, then had his orders revoked. This was right at the end of the war. And, well, nobody ever asked for the guns back. So they stayed in his possession and now belong to a private collector. Let me take a look at this. In addition to the suppressor, we also have a little OSS booby trap device to take a look at. This is called a Bushmaster, and this was a way to set up a, a tripwire booby trap that would fire an M3 submachine gun. So let's take a closer look at both that and how this suppressor actually works. So part of the reason that these were apparently quite popular is that the extra weight on the end did even more to help um, reduce the felt recoil of what was already a very controllable submachine gun. Now because the M3 has a detachable barrel, here's the standard barrel, uh, the silencer was made as simply an optional accessory. Um, when High Standard shipped these, or sold them and shipped them, they were shipped as a just the suppressor with its end cap and guide rod uh, and handle. You had to actually get the M3 submachine gun elsewhere. So there is our suppressor barrel, and we can take this end and unscrew it. It's a two-part thing here. This end is very much like a small pistol suppressor. It's hollow all the way down, 45 caliber in diameter, and uses mesh screens. Screens like these were used instead of baffles. Uh, the whole suppressor tube here is just filled with these little screens, and what they do is they provide airspace but with a lot of interference. So gas pressure will build up in that suppressor tube and then release much more slowly than if it were just a hollow tube, thus reducing the sound when it comes out the end. Now you can imagine the potential problems of trying to stack this quantity of little thin mesh screens into the suppressor uh, to clean it and then reassemble it. And for that reason, a guide rod was provided with the suppressor so that you can keep the whole thing indexed together like that. Now the more substantial portion of the unit is the rear end, and this has the actual barrel in it. And so we have a threaded front cap here. That comes off right there. And then we can pull the sleeve off of this and we have a heavily perforated barrel that is rifled inside though. And this roll of wire mesh. So this is used in place of baffles. Pretty interesting. This is not how suppressors are typically made anymore today. Let's see rifling in there. Now what there, these holes would serve two purposes. 
typically. One of them is to vent gas to reduce the speed of the bullet below the sound barrier, so that the bullet doesn't create a supersonic crack when it uh, travels downrange. However, 45 ACP is a subsonic cartridge uh, in all standard forms, so it wasn't necessary to reduce the velocity. However, the other purpose of these holes is to vent gas into this mesh screen, and that's done so that the, the gas fills up this larger volume before it exits out the bore, thus reducing the noise it makes. It is the same length as the standard M3 or M3A1 barrel, and totally interchangeable between the two models of gun, the, the regular or the A1 variant. So there is the complete M3 suppressed barrel assembly. Now, as for how quiet these really are, that's a question that kind of has, has a couple of different answers. Um, the one actual number I found was 89 decibels. However, that's from an old, uh, older document and there's no description of how it was measured. And you can get widely varying results on noise level depending on how far away noise is measured, how it, the duration of the noise that is measured. It's a difficult, it's a very difficult subject. So I don't want to take 89 decibels specifically as, as a, a definite number. Um, what's more important on a practical matter is what this did is absolutely reduce the sound of the, the shot below the, the noise level of the gun actually cycling. So with an M3, you, you have the bolt cycling back and forth like that, and that makes quite a lot of noise, as you can hear just dry cycling it. That level of noise was greater than what you got from the gun shot. And so at that point the suppressor's done as good of a job as it possibly can. There's not much point to making the bullet even quieter if you don't have a way to make the gun itself quieter. So, uh, at any rate, in order to reassemble this, I'm going to go ahead and put, put that back on and under its sleeve. Screw the front cap on. And then we can use this guide rod to keep all of those little metal mesh screens in place. Tighten that down. And then these were issued with a protective end cap. On that end, and then there's a threaded end on the guide rod here which would go to an aluminum handle, which unfortunately is missing on this particular one. But that is the complete assembly. Now this is a really cool piece of little OSS evil trickery. This is called a Bushmaster device, and this is designed to remotely fire a gun. So you can set up a gun as part of a booby trap. And that hook rests around the trigger, and this machined surface clamps onto the trigger guard of an M3. So the trigger this clamps on. So it clamps onto the gun like that. We have this tube at just a slightly oblique angle to the gun, and the hook at the end here securely holds onto the trigger. And then we have two types of threading on this end. We have a large uh, OSS American pattern thread, and we have a smaller British SOE pattern thread. So both organizations made their own devices, and this particular one was designed to be interchangeable. The idea here is that you could actually have a variety of trigger mechanisms. So the OSS and SOE were really quite clever and methodical in what they built and put a lot of thought into it. While the devices are all very simple, which is part of what makes them valuable, uh, they had uh, modularity was, was one of the prime considerations. So you had action stuff like this. So this is designed to fire a gun. You could also have things like uh, trip mines or various types of explosives. And then to go along with those, you had a whole bunch of modular triggering mechanisms. This is a pull type trigger, meaning that when you pull on this pin, it's going to release a spring and fire a striker. You would also have delay types, you had push types, so you had somewhere when you put weight on the device, 
it would fire a striker, but they were all, or virtually all, used the same uh, thread pitch and diameter. So you could attach, for example, a, a, a delay time pencil, which was a, a chemically delayed fuse, you could screw that onto this firing mechanism, or you could screw this pull type trigger onto this firing mechanism, or you could have used this with a variety of explosives. It was a, a very clever and modular catalog. So the way this worked, there is there are a pair of springs in here. There is basically there's one heavy spring with a striker that's held by a little cap and a smaller spring. So it takes a little bit of pressure pulling on this ring, which releases the first spring and then the second firing spring. It's a little complicated to describe. Uh, this pin is just the safety. You can see sort of down in there, it prevents the striker from actually going all the way forward should this get pulled. So when you were assembling your booby trap device, you would put it all together. This gets threaded onto here. This is an American one, so it fits the larger American thread. And then you'd set up your booby trap with the tripwire, and you'd tie the tripwire to that. And then the last thing you did before you left the scene would be to pull the safety pin out, and that leaves the whole trap live. And as soon as something pulls on this, the striker shoots forward. What happens is because there's a large spring in there, it's going to keep pressure on this trigger device. So it's not just going to fire one shot, the main spring in here is going to hold pressure down on this device and keep the trigger depressed and it will empty the entire magazine. So you want to make sure you have the gun well uh, well secured to a tree or, or whatever other position you're putting it in. And then there you go, one M3 grease gun booby trap. It's really cool not just to see one of what is really a quite rare modification to the M3, but in fact one that has very specific provenance from World War II. So if you're interested in the mechanics of the gun itself, I have a previous video I did on the M3 and the M3A1 submachine guns, uh, but definitely enjoy the opportunity here to take a look at the suppressor and the booby trap device. It's always cool seeing OSS gear from World War II. So uh, if you enjoy seeing this sort of thing online, please do consider checking out my Patreon page. It is uh, contributions from folks there that make it possible for me to find guns like this and bring them to you guys. Thanks for watching.